This episode is sponsored in part by NordVPN. Go to nordvpn.com slash cynicalhistorian to get an exclusive discount and four months free. Hey, Cypher here. Are you excited for the new Napoleon movie? I am. Well, it looks like fun and I definitely plan to review it once I can. It'll be especially interesting to see what events they chose to depict and what they skip. Because, man, did Napoleon have a hell of a story. So I figured I'd make a biography of the man, because he's one of the most influential people ever. In fact, there's really too much to talk about him, so I've tried to compact this a bit. As such, I'm not going to be talking too much about his strategy and tactics, that war. Frankly, I don't care about that kind of stuff. I'm much more concerned with his story. For history is the story of us, and his is one that changed the world. Because of his influence, there is an insane amount of history surrounding him. According to one historian, more books have been written with Napoleon in the title than there have been days since his death in 1821. So I'm simply trying to synthesize what I've read for y'all. I know some of you want me to be very judgmental, but he wasn't a historian, so I refuse to be so. He definitely wasn't a saint nor some evil villain. That naive view will blind anyone trying to understand history. There are some myths about Napoleon Bonaparte that need a quick rebuttal before we get started. He was not a warmonger nor a despot. He was actually rarely the aggressor in declaring a war, and his rule was relatively enlightened compared to basically every polity on Earth at the time. Those misconceptions have led to the idea of a Napoleonic complex, which is an incredible misnomer. It's also called small man syndrome, but he was actually quite average in height for the time. And since he wasn't a warmonger or despot, he couldn't be said to have been trying to make up for that false shortness by being overly aggressive. That's simply a legacy of British slander and disgruntled partisans, but he left a lie for historians to deal with himself. He basically wrote his own hagiography in his memoirs, plus all the sick events he brought along the way. They want to make him into the embodiment of the French Revolution, the enlightened dictator who brought all those enlightenment ideals to fruition. That too is false. In a way, he was not much different from other monarchs once he became emperor. While his military brilliance and governing acumen is undeniable, it is a far cry from liberty, fraternity, and equality that drove the revolution. He may have claimed to lead a republic, but monarchy is antithetical to republicanism. Intelligence and ambition drove him the most, not ideals. Getting past those myths allows for a much better comprehension of history, one that affects us all, even after two centuries. So, can I name where Napoleon came from? Of course I can. This video is sponsored by patrons like you and NordVPN. It's a virtual private network, which means that they serve as a proxy instead of your IP address, making your internet proclivities, whatever they may be, more difficult to track. So think if you want to access something that's region locked, like TV shows for the UK, you can use their service to seem like you're there. I use VPNs all the time for booking flights, because it's often cheaper if you're booking from near your destination than from your departure. There's so many more things than you can think of where you might not want to be tracked, so you can use NordVPN to mask your IP address, which is the key bit of information that allows trackers to discover who you are. Napoleon himself could have used it to hide that he was making exceptions for his continental system, but instead it was obvious to everyone and that led to his demise. So if you want to learn from Napoleon's mistake, go to nordvpn.com slash cynicalhistorian where you'll get a discounted annual subscription along with four free months. They've got a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you might as well try it. That's nordvpn.com slash cynicalhistorian, also linked in the description. Thanks to them for sponsoring, and on with the show. 
The Bonapartes were a Corsican family dating back to the 15th century, being from the Italian peninsula before that, hence why they'd go by Buonaparte until 1796. They were a fairly minor, even for a minor island. Corsica was always a fractious place, so Genoa sold it to France in 1764, and France promptly invaded four years later, exiling Pasquale Paoli, who had ruled as a president of a proclaimed independent republic since 1755. Napoleon was born just after the invasion concluded, in 1769, to a father who had sided with the French, becoming part of the newly created gentry. Napoleon himself resented French authority, but benefited from their patronage. He went to a few academies to learn the language and acculturate, since he grew up speaking Italian and ended up in the military, despite despising Louis XVI, becoming an officer in the rapidly advancing artillery. As a youth, he showed aptitude in poetry and philosophy, but the army drove him toward functional inquiries. Before he could do much of anything, though, the French Revolution broke out, making it difficult for him to provide for his family as the sole breadwinner out of five brothers. Given his hatred for the monarchy, Napoleon easily fit in with the Jacobins. Both he and his brother, Joseph, sided with Maximilien Robespierre, Returning to Corsica, they got involved in the fractiousness of Paoli's return. Napoleon went on a farcical expedition to Sardinia before returning to the mainland as an artillery officer. The ranks had thinned thanks to the revolution and awaited his rise. He knew how to wield cannons, but had yet to test his mettle. The centralization of power during the terror created a series of revolts. In Toulon, Napoleon helped plan a crucial seizure of the heights with artillery, earning him easy promotion. Only a year later, Robespierre fell victim to his own terror. The Bonapartes were imperiled by this change of affairs, but slipped the guillotine. During the unrest of the following couple of years, he might have used grape shot to halt a mob in Paris, kind of his first time in close quarters fighting. During a brief period between military appointments, Napoleon married a divorcee named Josephine de Beauharnais. She took his proposal largely to pay her own debts and even cheated on him regularly at first. He'd take a series of mistresses, but only after learning of her liaison. So Napoleon, indisputably one of the most important men in history, was a cuckold. Before he could find out though, he took command of a campaign in Italy during the War of the First Coalition, only a few days after his wedding, in fact. French troops were undersupplied and Napoleon had yet to prove himself as a capable general. Yet, he quickly had Austria on the run, using his signature move of enveloping an enemy through rapid and pre-planned maneuvering. The army pushed deep into German territory before Emperor Francis sued for peace. It was a magnificent victory. On top of that, as part of a peace agreement, he captured Venice and ended their more than thousand-year-old republic. Britain remained belligerent. France couldn't adequately challenge their navy, but Napoleon hatched a crazy plan to hinder their commerce by conquering some key trading points. He led the capture of Malta and then invaded Egypt with a force of 40,000. Included among them were scientists and scholars who would make numerous breakthroughs such as discovering the Rosetta Stone and document much of the ancient ruins throughout the area. Napoleon himself played up the part of an enlightened ruler, here to liberate the once great kingdom from Mamluk tyranny. This was placating the local populace with cultural relativism. When ruling captured territory, he revealed a key factor that made his command so strident and powerful. He was a meticulous micromanager. His Armée de Orient made an arduous journey from Alexandria to Cairo. Despite the wanton calamity of that movement, he proved that he could push his soldiers to move far more rapidly than most generals, which was repeatedly useful throughout his career. They readily conquered Egypt, putting down a nasty revolt with severe brutality. The British Navy managed to find France's ships, and despite the British being outnumbered, readily defeated the far worse performing French, and thereby obliterating Napoleon's connection to Europe. So he embarked on an ill-fated attack up into Ottoman Syria, which includes today's Palestine, Israel, and Lebanon. He had some vain hope of going from there all the way to India, as though he were Alexander the Great, 
and stabbing at the British Empire in her most important colony. The march weakened them tremendously, and when they successfully besieged Jaffa, Napoleon ordered more than a couple thousand prisoners massacred, guaranteeing stiff resistance everywhere they went. Hence why he couldn't break the defense of Acre a couple weeks later. The army returned to Egypt in failure, though they defeated an Ottoman invasion at Abakir. Napoleon returned to France before his commanders even knew it, selfishly abandoning Egypt and his own men, though France would remain in control for a couple of very rebellious years. The directory that had ruled the French Republic since 1795 had lost public confidence. Intrigue after intrigue threatened their power, and one was bound to succeed. A second coalition formed against France, and the economy was faring poorly in 1799. Several key players were organizing a coup, and the Bonapartes took part. Heh, <laughs> Bonapartes took part. It was basically bloodless, involving many machinations about suppressing a coup and granting emergency powers to the plotters. When they dissolved the Council of 500, supposedly some of the council pulled daggers, allowing the grenadiers to ensure their compliance, while Lucian Bonaparte theatrically pledged that he would plunge a knife into his brother if he ever proved to become a tyrant. Three consuls ruled France, with Napoleon as the most important of them. Soon Napoleon consolidated power under a new constitution, passed in a rigged plebiscite. This government had the semblance of checks and balances, but largely centered control on the first consul. Almost immediately, people attempted to assassinate him. Throughout his rule, there would be dozens of plots, some that came very near fruition. Using this as reasoning, the consulate passed extreme restrictions on publications and speech. Censorship was commonplace everywhere else, but quite the violation of revolutionary principles. Nonetheless, British newspapers and magazines readily filtered into French society, always lampooning Napoleon in ways he consistently took umbrage with. Throughout all of this, France still had to defeat the Second Coalition. In a daring move, Napoleon marched 40,000 troops through the Alps, a feat unknown since the time of Charlemagne. They were halted at a fort, but pressed on into Italy. Napoleon proved adept at predicting the enemy's movements and pre-planning a pincer formation to envelop them, which he did at the decisive Battle of Marengo, forcing the Austrians from Italy altogether. Even Britain signed a peace in 1802 at Amiens that lasted for two years, securing Napoleon's power as first consul. His war plans weren't all successes, though. He sent an army to take back Haiti, which failed miserably. They resorted to horrendous atrocities, including using barges with burning sulfur to massacre prisoners, essentially the first gas chambers. Napoleon ordered the reinstatement of slavery after a decade of abolition. Nonetheless, once his hopes for another New World Empire were fully dashed, he sold the Louisiana Territory for a pittance to the United States, partially as recompense after he'd forced the conclusion of a brief war between both republics at the beginning of his consulship. France had only gained the territory back from Spain in an exchange three years prior, and was kind of a violation of that agreement. More successful were the sister republics France had created throughout the 1790s. Most were client states. In an effort to appease conservative forces during the early consular years, Napoleon gave back the Papal States to Pope Pius VII in 1800, and a year later came to a concordat to reinstate Catholicism in France. The following year, national representatives voted to make Napoleon consul for life, and a plebiscite confirmed it, making France essentially a republic in name only. Almost in reaction, Britain declared war in 1803, but not much came of that at first. He had appointed four jurists and himself to create a series of civil laws that were more effective and able to be duplicated elsewhere, combining many historical codes and reworking everything they could into something cohesive. That was complete by 1801, but went unpublished until 1804. The Napoleonic Code became the blueprint for civil codes all over Europe, and eventually the rest of the world though Napoleon always showed a fascinating amount of flexibility to support local customs. 
In May of 1804, the Senate granted him the title Emperor of France. He'd continued to claim republicanism, but the definition of republic is that it is not a monarchy. He consolidated a number of sister republics as kingdoms under his control, placing much of his family on various thrones throughout the empire. Starting immediately, he began ennobling people with feudal titles, recreating kind of an aristocracy, which he would formalize in 1808 after much experimentation. Finally, he reorganized the French military, creating the Grande Armée, which used his new corps system. This new type of division was effectively an entire army within an army, with all the types of units necessary to be self-sufficient, yet under a larger command, each corps comprising around 40 to 80,000 soldiers. These corps would have several generals and be led by a baton-wielding marshal. Elite troops would be placed in the Imperial Guard, which eventually comprised Napoleon's reserve troops grouped by their level of experience hence the name Young, Middle, and Old Guards. This is largely how armies would organize until World War I, and is still an essential part of military organization today. European powers quickly took umbrage with this upstart Corsican declaring himself an emperor, so they formed another coalition against him. He rode out in 1805 to face them with this new Grand Armée, and a few allied countries as well. The corps system was extremely effective, granting Napoleon his greatest battlefield victory at Austerlitz, allowing him to dictate the terms of peace with relative impunity. His navy was different, because Britain handed them an extreme defeat at the Cape of Trafalgar, which attained Royal Navy dominance over the world's oceans until the United States supplanted that during World War II. Britain used this to blockade the continent and remain free of the Grand Armée's overwhelming might. Nonetheless, Napoleon had made enough gains to create the Confederation of the Rhine, essentially the first step toward uniting Germany and substantially inciting nationalism everywhere after Romanticism created the intellectual circumstances for it. This victory inevitably led to another coalition war against Napoleon three months later. Yet again, Napoleon brought out the Grand Armée and trounced the opposition, pushing it all the way to Prussia's capital of Berlin in less than a month and marching further into former Poland before Sweden and Russia surrendered in July of 1807. While those two were worthy adversaries, Napoleon chose to punish Prussia by tremendously reducing her territory, something that would come back to bite him, since the very militaristic country would remain embittered. On a river near Tilsit, he met with Tsar Alexander I to hammer out an agreement. They became the best of friends there, seemingly a bromance that could last forever, even reaffirming it in Erfurt a year later. All of this maneuvering created a response to Britain's naval hegemony, the Continental System. Essentially, French allies were supposed to block all trade with Britain. The UK economy being driven by international merchants, the idea was that cutting them off would cripple that. Land versus water. How could terra firma, the unsinkable blockade, lose? Trying to enforce the Continental System was actually the source of Napoleon's ultimate defeat. At his triumphant peak, he had sowed the seed of his own destruction. Troubles involving the Continental System began almost immediately. Sweden refused and Russia attacked them for it. Closer to home, Portugal also refused. France, in coordination with Spain, invaded and occupied the entire country, though the Portuguese king and his entourage managed to escape. French troops also took several Spanish fortresses, which caused many problems for Spaniards, leading to a mutiny and the abdication of Charles IV for his son. But then he contested that. France summoned the famously dysfunctional Spanish family to Bayonne to supposedly hammer out an agreement. Instead, Napoleon put his brother Joseph on the Spanish throne. Three days prior, on the 2nd of May, 1808, Spain arose in popular revolt. France easily defeated the Spanish military, but a guerrilla war developed instead. It became an intractable conflict that Joseph and Napoleon could not solve, despite resorting to executions in response to guerrilla brutality. Britain took the opportunity to support the rebellion. Starting from Lisbon, the entire Iberian Peninsula remained in a state of warfare for half a decade, pushing and pulling in fits and starts, with rebel chiefs picking at the sides. This showed France was weak, 
So yet another coalition formed against her, using the Continental System as their excuse to fight. The War of the Fifth Coalition was easy to defeat. The Allies lasted for a mere six months against France. But the Peninsular War continued. The British remained belligerent, and the Continental System was somewhat secure. Now, Napoleon simply needed to secure his dynasty. Josephine couldn't produce an heir due to complications from her previous marriage, so he divorced her and sought a new empress, which he found in the recently defeated Austrian Empire, now forced into an alliance. He married Emperor Francis's daughter, Marie-Louise. They produced a boy who would only live to be 21 and no other heirs. This marriage might have angered Tsar Alexander, whose sisters had been contemplated and even approached, but that doesn't explain Alexander's next move. France started granting certain exemptions to the continental system, obviously favoring themselves in order to make a profit. Louis Bonaparte, who had been made King of Holland, used this to basically ignore the entire system, leading to Napoleon deposing him and annexing Holland. Russia also started ignoring the system, despite the Erfurt Agreement, which led to another war. Napoleon gathered an alliance and invaded Russia in June 1812. They pushed further and further trying to have a decisive battle that would end the war. This was not the rapid march of his previous campaigns. He rode in a carriage most of the way, and his marshals and generals brought their own luxuries along as well. Russians scorched the earth behind them as they retreated deeper and deeper ahead of the French. Once they reached Smolensk in August, that seemed like a perfect halt before winter set in, especially after a horrifically costly battle at Borodino could have made Napoleon retreat back. Instead, he kept on in the hope that a decisive battle for Moscow would end the war. He reached that city only after it had been evacuated. Arsonists set it ablaze instead. There was still time to return to Smolensk, but Napoleon decided to stay in Moscow for too long, beginning a retreat just as a very bitter winter set in. Since Russia had destroyed so much, forage was meager and the Grand Armée was ill-prepared for just how bad the cold would be. Truly dreadful conditions led to soldiers eating their horses, and in some cases, even each other, while Russians marched parallel to the retreat, inflicting even more casualties with quick raids on France's beleaguered troops. By the time the invasion returned in late 1812, over 800,000 casualties from both sides littered the thousand-kilometer path they had taken. It was a disaster, and everyone could tell Napoleon's regime was living on borrowed time. Later in life, Napoleon would argue that the best time for him to have been killed in combat was at Borodino. He had to flee ahead of his army to secure Paris from open intrigues, though his soldiers interpreted this as another abandonment like in Egypt. Within weeks of his return, British General Wellington was making strides in Spain, pushing France back. Napoleon would depose his brother in favor of Ferdinand VII, hoping to appease Spaniards and halt the Peninsular War, but Wellington kept pushing onwards, eventually taking Spain back. Before that, a sixth coalition had formed and Napoleon mustered a meager army to meet it. Initially, he had some success, despite having very little cavalry. Clemens von Metternich called a truce at Plaswitz, which was just long enough for the Allies to regroup and prepare for a serious battle. At Leipzig, the Allies decisively defeated Napoleon in the largest European battle prior to World War I. In his disorganized retreat, he did manage to make a few victories, so Metternich proposed a peace with France keeping her natural borders. Even though Napoleon agreed to it, Britain did not, so the war continued as the French line collapsed. They mounted a desperate defense, but after the failure of Russia, the citizenry weren't willing to volunteer anymore, especially once one of Napoleon's marshals surrendered an entire corps, leading to his abdication after Paris fell. That night, he attempted suicide, but failed. The Bourbons were once again in charge of France, 
While the Allies, led by Metternich, met in Vienna to decide how to rule Europe after so many years of warfare, Napoleon went into exile, ruling the small island of Elba. He still had a retinue, small military and title, but it was a purposeful insult. He kept track of the public sentiment, and clearly French people were dissatisfied with the possibility of Louis XVIII bringing back feudalism. So one night, Napoleon boarded a small flotilla and sailed to France. He faced no resistance on the way to Paris, even having some soldiers switch loyalties for him, though they could have easily defeated him right there. Louis fled and Napoleon bloodlessly took back France in 1815. This was a period known as the Hundred Days. Of course, the European powers joined in one last coalition to defeat him. The Congress at Vienna had basically decided the fate of peace, but now they needed to secure it against Napoleon. Yet France was ready and willing to sign up this time, save for another uprising in the Vendée. Napoleon tried to halt the Allies from coming together by defeating some Prussians and turning against Wellington at Waterloo. But he made some key mistakes at this battle in not attacking with full enough force, which allowed the Prussians to regroup and surprise him losing the battle. It was a general rout, and Napoleon tried to flee France altogether. He hoped to take some ships to New York and live in America, but a British blockade stopped him. So Britain sent him to the remote island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic, where he would live out the rest of his years in a little mansion away from the rest of the population, with a tiny retinue to keep him company. He had some petty fights with his keepers, but most of his time was spent in luxury and writing two works, a biography of Caesar and a memoir that became the best-selling book of the 19th century after the Bible. He was sickly much of the time and died in 1821. Napoleon's brief 51 years changed Europe forever in ways that are difficult to quantify. Using this legacy in 1848, his nephew took power in France, naming himself Napoleon III. Karl Marx would memorably write of this, Hegel says somewhere that great historic facts and personages recur twice. He forgot to add, once as tragedy and again as farce. While this new incarnation inspired hope of a Bonapartist revival, it ultimately failed when Prussia trounced France in 1871. There's still holdouts of Bonapartism today, but Napoleon's real legacy is his civil code, military brilliance, and the creation of a new age that still affects us today. I have you now. Here. Yeah. Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? Thank you. Mwah. I. Meow. Meow. If you're gonna meow, you're gonna get picked up. That's the cost. Yes, hi. Mm, you're a good boy. Why are you rubbing on the camera? Stop it. You having fun down there? It's making too much noise. Do you have to play with the one that has a bell on it? Really? God fucking... It's 11 o'clock at night and that's when the guns come out apparently. Ain't Albuquerque grand. In Toulon, Napoleon... In Toulon... Toulon? Toulon? To ah, I hate French. They're the reason why we can't spell anything in English. Surprised King isn't interrupting. You know your namesake is somebody who literally held more of France than the French king at the time, right? You should be angry about Napoleon. And pre-planning a pincer... And pre-planning a prin... And pre-planning a pincer... And pre-planning a pincer formation. Formation. Formation.